Are the Georgia Guidestones as simple as what they appear to be, tenants to live by after the apocalypse? Was the mysterious R.C. Christian a traveler from outer space or another dimension? Why the hell haven't I gone to see these things for myself yet? Stick around and you might just find out the answers to these questions on this episode of Unsolved Mysteries. So, Welcome back to the show, guys. It's another glorious, mysterious Saturday. And there is a fruit fly in my recording booth. That's so annoying. Don't you hate it when they invade <sighs> your space like that? I just saw it go right by my eyes over the top of my mic. Oh, <laughs> those are the worst. You son of a bitch. Thankfully, I I oh, wow, that's... <laughs> Thankfully my fruit flies quick. haven't discovered my recording area. They just tend to hang out in the living room. Anyway, Saturday is the most mysterious day of the week, as you all know. And I am your humble host... Dr. Chad Kimmons, joined by your other not so humble host, Dr. <laughs> Cassandra Cherry. Hey, hey, you heard me. She brags about her PhD all the time, guys. It's really annoying. I mean, and it's, frankly, I a little disgusting. It. I, I earned it. I went all the way out to a scary back alley in the middle of the night just to hand this guy a, a, a wad full of cash to get my PhD. I, I earned this. She'll literally call me at three in the morning and be like, hey, did I mention that I have a PhD? And I'm like, yeah, I was there. I'm like, I don't know. Why, why are you doing this? No. Uh, <laughs> I just need some clout, guys. I'm desperate for that clout. Before we get started uh, on this week's mystery, I do want to clear up a couple of things. Um, when I said that we would be announcing the winners of the contest on the 19th, I was mistaken. You will have until the 19th, technically the 20th at midnight to submit your entry. And that's when we'll be drawing winners is on the 20th. And then the announcement will come the following week on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you already left us a review prior to the start of the contest, you can still enter. Just shoot us a screenshot of the review that you left and we'll get you added to the pool. No skin off our back. I had somebody ask me about that a couple of days ago. So now that's out of the way. Cassandra, how much do you know about, do you know anything about the Georgia Guidestones? I know that they're in the state Georgia and not the country Georgia. I assume they were left by Anunnaki. That's no. generally the trend with these sort of things. Uh, this is actually one where we know where they came from. The really? Question, the mystery here isn't where did they come from, it's what the f*** are they for? Okay, yeah, that too. <laughs> what are they for? Because, I mean, it's... As you'll see as I t as we go through the story here, and this is a pretty long one, it's... Uh, you'll see. Okay. So, so uh, I guess let's just go ahead and dive right in here. Uh-huh. The story of the Georgia Guidestones began on a Friday afternoon in June of 1979. It was a dark and a, stormy night. It was a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that. <laughs> it was a dark and stormy afternoon. <laughs> An elegant gray-haired gentleman showed up in Elbert County in Georgia. He made his way to the offices of Elberton Granite Finishing and introduced himself as Robert C. Christian, or as we will refer to him throughout the rest of the story, R.C. Christian. Okay. Uh, he claimed that he represented a small group of loyal Americans who were planning the installation of an unusually large and like super complex stone monument. And he had, he had come to Elberton because it was the granite capital of the world, and he believed that its quarries could produce the finest stone on the planet. Okay. Joe Findlay, uh, Elberton Granite's president, uh, he was really distracted when this guy came in and started talking to him about it because he was doing weekly payroll and stuff. Yeah. But when Christian started to describe the monument, Findlay stopped what he was doing because the man was asking for stones larger than anything that had ever been quarant quarantined, <laughs> had ever been <laughs> quarried in this county, and he wanted them cut, finished, and assembled into this like enormous astronomical instrument. Okay. And when Findlay asked what it would be for, Christian explained that the structure he had in mind would serve as a compass, a calendar, and a clock. And it would also need to be engraved with a set of guides written in uh, eight of the world's major languages, which we'll get to in a bit. 
<laughs> He's like, we're gonna combine Stonehenge and the Rosetta Stone into one monument. And we're gonna do it in the modern era where people will continuously question everything I do rather than being able to say, the gods made me do it. And kind of, not necessarily the Ten Commandments. Uh -huh. uh, the first written laws, I can't remember. The Code of Hammurabi, that's what I was saying. Yeah, eye for an eye and all that. That was the, the first written laws that were carved into a giant, like, obelisk. Mm-hmm. So kind of like that, you know? I mean, it's super cool, but it's also just like, why are you doing this? <laughs> we have clocks and satellites and the internet. Wait, what, right. what era was this? This was in the 80s. Okay, 80s. That makes so much more sense. But even without the internet... I mean, it's it was supposed to like survive the apocalypse. Yeah. Might come because it also had to be capable of withstanding the most catastrophic events. Uh, so that, like, as they put it, the shattered remnants of humanity would be able to use these guides to reestablish a better civilization than the one that was about to destroy itself. I mean, love, but also, did what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's far enough it's, away from Yellowstone to be, like, able to survive that, being in Georgia, but, I mean, nuclear apocalypse? Could that actually? I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, but, like, you see why, why it's mysterious now. It's Yeah. Like, already we're in what the f***, this is so weird territory. Yeah, seriously. Um, the, the monument currently sits at the highest point in Elbert County, uh, and it's oriented to track the sun's east to west migration every year. On the equinox or the solstice, uh, people who stand at the west side of what's called the mail slot. Let me try that again without hitting my mic. <laughs> the mail slot? Yeah. Like, it's it's like a little slot in the stone. Okay. They, they just call it the mail slot. <laughs> but people who stand at the west side of this, they're positioned to see the sunrise on the horizon. Yeah. And there's an eye level hole drilled into the center support stone that allows people on the south side to locate the North Star, uh -huh. and then there's a 7 8 inch hole drilled through the capstone that focuses a sunbeam on the center column, and at noon, it points to the day of the year. That is so weird. That's so cool, but that's so weird. Right, yeah, it's it's really, like, like as, as I was researching this, I was like, man, I want to go to Georgia now. I, yeah, <laughs> I want to see I've, this thing. I've been to Georgia once for Dragon Con, but man, they've been holding out on me. Uh, so, Finley's is deceased now, but... Uh, shortly after the Guidestones went up, an Atlanta television reporter asked what he was thinking when he first heard Christian's plan, and he said, quote, I was thinking, I got a nut in here now. How am I going to get him out? <laughs> and and he, he kept attempting to discourage this guy, Christian, by, like, he quoted him a price several times higher than any project he had ever done before, you know, because the job was going to require special tools and heavy equipment and... He's going to have to have paid consultants. But Christian just asked how long it would take. And Finley said it would take at least six months. But he wouldn't even be able to consider taking this, uh, taking on this job until he knew it could be paid for. Yeah. And when Christian asked whether well, there, there was a banker in town that he considered trustworthy, Finley saw his chance to get rid of this guy and sent him look for, to look for Wyatt Martin, who was the president of Granite City Bank. Now, Martin, who is the only man in Elberton besides Findlay, who we know met R.C. Christian face to face, uh -huh. which adds to the mystery because nobody else actually, as, as far as we know, these are the only two people who have ever met this man face to face. What the hell? Yeah, not just in Elberton. Like, I mean, just in general. Yeah, because uh, like everything is so secretive about this. Now, Martin is seventy-eight now. Uh -huh. And he said, quote, Findlay called me and said, a kook over here wants some kind of crazy mar monument. But when the fella showed up, he was wearing a very nice expensive suit, mm -hmm. which made me take him a little more seriously. Because people with money should always be taken seriously. Well, I mean, considering the, he's going to a bank. Ah, uh, fair. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and he also said he was well-spoken. Obviously, he was an educated person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was he was taken aback when the man told him straight out that R.C. Christian was a pseudonym. 
Like basically admitting, you know, like this isn't my real name. Yeah, I kind of figured. I was going to put that in my theory. Yeah, no, it's, he's, like I said, very secretive. Yeah. He also said that his group had been planning this secretly for 20 years and they wanted to remain anonymous forever. (laughs) And when he told him what it was uh, that his group wanted to do, okay, so Martin said, quote, when he told me what it was that his group wanted to do, I just about fell over. I told him, I believe you'd be just as well off to take the money and throw it out in the street into the gutters. Oh my gosh. But I mean, hey, their money, I guess they get to do what they want with it. And he said, he just sort of looked at me and shook his head like he felt kind of sorry for me. And he said, you don't understand. Clearly. So, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, well, (laughs) duh. So, uh, Martin took Christian down the street to the town square where the city had commissioned this big bicentennial memorial fountain mm-hmm. uh, that included thir- a ring of 13 granite panels. Each were like two by three feet, and they were signifying the original colonies. Yeah. And he told them that that was the biggest project that was ever undertaken, and it was nothing compared to what he was talking about. But he said that did not seem to bother Mr. Christian. Yeah. He promised that he would return by Monday and went off to charter a plane and spend the weekend scouting locations from the air. And Martin said, by then, I half believed him. Okay. So he's just like, it's so crazy, it much, might just work. Oh, right. Like, I mean, imagine imagine a, a guy like that comes into, you know, your place of business and he's just so intense and so, like, he's obviously very dedicated to what he's saying. Mm-hmm. He's got that charisma. And he's, he's confident that he can pay for it, you know. Like, I'd, I'd probably believe him, too. I don't know if I would believe all of the, like, you know, it's almost new agey. Yeah. He's got that vibe. Stuff that he was spouting, but I'd, I'd believe that he was probably good for the money, you know. Yeah, yeah. So when Christian came back to the bank on Monday, Martin told him that he could not proceed unless he could verify the man's true identity. And, like, get some kind of assurance that he could pay for this thing. And eventually the two negotiated an agreement where Christian would reveal his real name on the condition that Martin would never, ever disclose the information to another living soul. Okay. And agree to destroy all documents and records related to the project when it was finished. Mm -hmm. And he would be the sole intermediary and he would sign a confidentiality agreement pledging the... Just said, yeah. Right. And he said he was going to send the money from different banks across the country because he wanted to make sure that it couldn't be traced. And he made it very clear that he was very serious about this remaining secret. Right. Hence the mystery and why we're talking right. about it now. <laughs> right. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's just really almost like government conspiracy level, like MIBs type yeah. shit. Because like here again... To our knowledge... It's never come to light. Right. The This article was written in... The article that I got most of this information from was written in 2009. Mm-hmm. Wyatt Martin was 78 back then, so he's probably getting up there in years if he hasn't died. Yeah. But if he's still alive, he is the only person on the planet that we know of that knows R.C. Christian's real name. So... And he's not going to tell... Yeah, no, he's... If he hasn't by if, now. Even if Christian's dead, like, he's... I mean, he's still under a... a NDA. Confidentiality agreement, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before leaving town, Christian met with Finley again. And he gave him a shoebox containing a wooden model of the monument that he wanted. And about ten pages of extremely detailed specifications. Mm-hmm. And Finley took all this from him, but he was, like, still pretty skeptical until... Martin called him the next Friday and said that he had just received a $10,000 deposit. Apparently after that, Findlay just stopped questioning it and got straight to work. He's like, okay, who am I <laughs> to judge? Yeah. Let's do this. We got the mula in the bank. Let's go. Like, we got a $10,000 deposit. This guy seems to be good for the rest of the money. Let's do this. Like, I mean, shit. Because it doesn't say how much he paid for it. Like, overall. But But, if $10,000 was the deposit... Yeah, because usually a deposit's only like 5%. Oh, shit. When you you have to do like a down payment, you know? Yeah. Uh, So, I mean, this is 
He's paying a shitload of money for this. Mm-hmm. It's gotta be like a Rockefeller or something. Uh, you would think, or an alien. Da -da -da. Uh, <laughs> but apparently Finley's daughter uh, said that this was the most challenging project in the entire history of Elbert County. Yeah. Which doesn't surprise me, because like when we get into the you know, how big these stone slabs were, you'll understand just how oh, yeah. massive it was. <clears throat> or is, rather. Because it still stands today. Like, it's a huge, huge tourist attraction. Which, again, we'll get into that here in a bit. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, construction of the Guidestones uh, started later that summer. And Findlay's company uh, documented the progress of the work in hundreds of photographs. There were jackhammers that were used to gouge uh, 114 feet into the rock at Pyramid Quarry. They were looking for hunks of granite big enough to yield the final stones. And Finley and his crew held their says held their breath when the first 28 ton slab was lifted to the surface. 28 ton? 28 ton. Damn. They were afraid that their derricks would buckle under this weight. Obviously, you know. Yeah. They actually had a special burner that was like a narrowly focused rocket motor. Yeah. It's used to cut and finish large blocks of granite. They trucked it in to Elberton to clean and size the stones. And a pair of master stone cutters were hired to smooth them out. Okay. Finley and Martin helped Christian find a suitable site for the Guidestones in Elbert County. Uh, they found a flat-topped hill uh, rising above the pastures of the Double Seven Farms, which I don't know what that is, but... Me either. That's just what it says. Double O Seven Farms. And then you hear just... Dun, dun, <laughs> dun, dun, in the distance. But apparently there were vistas in all directions. And he paid $5,000 to the owner, Wayne Mullinex, uh -huh. who signed over a five-acre plot. And in addition, Christian granted lifetime cattle grazing rights to Mullinex and his children. And uh, Mullinex's construction company got to lay the foundation for the Guidestones. Okay. So he got 5000 for the plot. His cattle would have lifetime grazing rights on the plot. And he also got paid for laying the foundation. Like, he yeah. basically, you know, like, got the contract for that. Wow. Like a very good deal. It's yeah. Just like, like, that. Absolutely. So after the purchase of the land, uh, Christian said goodbye to Findlay at the Granite Company office and said, you will never see me again. And then he walked out the door without so much as a handshake. Damn. That's cold. And like, I mean, it's it just gets more and more. Bizarre. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, it reminds me of... You know those, like, old, old money New York-style people who are just really f***ing eccentric and shit? Yeah. That's kind of what this guy reminds me of. Yeah, he's he's got those eccentric, rich old man vibes, and it's like, I don't know if you're cool or if you're, like, secretly plotting to take over the world. God, what's that dude's name that has way too much Money. Elon Musk? No, something Branson. I mean, there's a lot of guys with too much money, to be fair. Um, Rich oh, it is Richard Branson. Okay. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking it was Richard Branson. Yeah, he's like this super eccentric dude, and like he he just has way too much money, but he's so f weird. Huh. Like, look him up sometime when you get a chance. He's really f weird. Okay. And he's he's just one of those super eccentric rich people. And he's, he's not old money. He made his money himself, but he's still just this, like, super eccentric, almost in a bad way. <laughs> huh. Makes me wonder why I haven't heard of him before. Yeah, I don't know. He's he's pretty famous. He's an English dude. Ah, English. That's probably why. <laughs> well, because, like, there's a, there's a bit on Family Guy. I don't remember what it was. He's, like, in a boardroom. They mention him, and then it does a cutaway. And he's, like, in a boardroom talking about something, and he jumps out the window, and then, like reappears back above the window riding on like an airship and he just goes i have way too much money and the airship takes off that is hilarious <laughs> and like the thing is that's not outside the realm of possibility for this dude <laughs> oh my god oh uh, i mean you do you dude but as, as long as you're not hurting people but just oh, why do people have so right. much money <laughs> so yeah like just He's just really, it seems like a really eccentric, old, old money type person. Mm -hmm. After that, Christian only communicated through Martin. He would write a few weeks later to ask 
that the ownership of the land and the monument be transferred to Elbert County, and they still hold ownership of both. Um, okay. I assume that his previous agreement with the uh, Mullinex guy is still stands as well, though. Yeah, as it should. Because it's just, they just own it, you know. Yeah. But the guy still has lifetime grazing rights and whatnot. Apparently he did this because he said that he uh, was pretty sure that, like, civic pride would protect the monument over time. Yeah, because people would look at that and be like, holy shit, we haven't seen something like this since ancient Greece. Hmm. All right, <laughs> this is ours now. Right. Uh, but Martin said that all of Mr. Christian's correspondence came from different cities around the country. He never sent anything from the same place twice. What the hell? Again, <laughs> furthering the, you know, the, mis- the secrecy and the, mysteries, the mystery. Where did you come uh, from? Where did you go? Right. So, was the, his name the Ash- Cotton Eye Joe? No, and we're not. We got stop it. <laughs> you know what you're doing. <laughs> I love that joke. So, the astrological specifications for this thing were so complex that Finley actually had to retain the services of an astronomer from the University of Georgia to uh, help implement the design of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the four outer stones were to be oriented based on the limits of the sun's yearly migration. And the center column needed two precisely calibrated features. A hole through which the North Star could be seen at all times, like we talked. Yeah. And a slot that was to align with the position of the rising sun during the solstice and equinox, again, which we talked about. And then the principal component of the capstone was that seven-eighths inch hole through which the, the sunlight beam would pass through. Yeah. But apparently it was, you know, like, these are like construction dudes. They're, they're not going to know how to do this. Mm-hmm. So they had to get, a, like, a legit astronomer to come do and the be maths. on, yeah, basically be on retainer until the thing was finished. Yeah. It's like, we got to ask you a question real fast. Where does, where does the sun rise again? Because I know it's the east, but, like, the, this has to be very specific by degrees. I'm just imagining, like, hey, we need your help with something. What do you need your help? Need your, my help with? Um, see math. <laughs> what kind of math? I don't know. <laughs> We're not sure. We just know it's math, and we need somebody who knows math. Do you know math? We do geometry. This is something else. <laughs> right. This requires calculus, and you know that's just above our pay grade. Well, what's going on with these slabs? We know how big they need to be, and we know that these things need to be very specific, but we don't know where to put them. uh, The main feature of this monument, though, was Uh going to be the the ten dictates that we talked about. Uh, They were carved into both faces of the outer stones in English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Arabic, Hebrew, Hindi, and Swahili. Why Swahili? That's, I don't know. Maybe (laughs) that was just, well... Because English covers, English, Spanish, Russian, and Chinese covers most of the planet. Yeah. And then Arabic covers the Middle East. Yeah, and any country that is majority Muslim. Right. And then Hebrew because Jewish people. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you can't leave out the Hebrews. Hindi because India is... Gigantic. What, the second largest nation in the world? Right behind... No. Third. it's got the, like, second largest population, I think. Right, because I, I think landmass, it goes Russia, China, and India. I think it's Russia, China, ca- uh, Canada, India, honestly. Mm. Canada's gigantic. About Canada. Yeah, Canada goes, like, clear up to f- the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Like, don't ever discount Canada. They will be able to whip our asses if they ever stop saying sorry. <laughs> and then, so I'm guessing Swahili was just to cover the rest of the world, which would be... Is Swahili the lingua franca of the entirety of Africa? I mean, I don't, I don't think, think it so. would be. Because I know that French would make sense, because a lot of African countries speak French. Yeah, it's the most spoken language in Africa, so that's probably why he included Swahili, was to cover Africa. Okay. Interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that. So that makes sense. That covers, yeah. you know, all of the major languages in the world. Yeah. And by early 1980, 
A bulldozer was scraping the double seven hilltop to bedrock where five granite slabs, uh, the foundation, were laid out in a paddle wheel design. Okay. There was a hundred foot tall crane that was used to lift the stones into place. And each of the outer rocks was 16 feet, four inches high, six feet, six six inches wide, and one foot, seven inches thick. Huh. Uh, The center column was the same, except it was only half the width. And the capstone measured nine feet, eight inches long, six feet, six inches wide, and one foot, seven inches thick. And each slab weighed over 20 tons. That is crazy. Including the foundation? The entire monument, the total weight, was almost 240,000 pounds. Yeah. Which would be what? uh, 120,000 tons? Yeah. That checks out. So. (laughs) Just, that is so much. Why did, why would anyone need that much? That is so much. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) But like they said, you know, it's the greatest undertaking of yeah, this place. in modern I'm, history even. Probably, yeah. Uh, now, the monument ignited a bunch of controversy before it was even finished. Oh yeah, uh, I can f- imagine. <laughs> as, yeah, I was going to say, as you might imagine, like, people wondering what the f*** is going on. The first rumor began among members of the Elberton Granite Association. Uh, they were jealous of the attention that was being showered on one of their own, Findlay, who was behind the whole thing. Yeah. And also they were jealous of Martin because Martin was part of it, you know. Oh, yeah. And the gossip became so poisonous that the two men agreed to take a lie detector test at the Elberton Civic Center. Shit. Because, like, again, these are the only two people who had ever met R.C. Christian. And I guess people were... Skeptical. Like, yeah, they were like, no, you're just doing this for publicity. Like, you're the ones who are building this. Yeah. And so they took a lie detector test... And, you know, the, the rumors and the gospel quickly went away when the Elberton Star reported that they had both passed the lie detector test convincingly. But this publicity brought a whole new wave of complaints. <laughs> because as word of what was being inscribed on these uh, slabs spread, Martin says that, like, even people he considered friends were asking him why he was doing the devil's work. Oh, my land. Uh, here we go again. <laughs> yep. Burn the witch! <laughs> they dressed me up like this. No, we didn't. A bit. She... <laughs> we did the nose. <laughs> <laughs> she turned me into a newt. I got better. And what floats? <laughs> a duck! Where were we? Uh, we were f***ing bitches. No, we were, we were ducking witches. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's Cockney sli- ranting slime. I mean, slanti- ranting s- slime. <laughs> <laughs> ranting, ranting slime just makes me think of like a slime monster from D and D. That just like its only attack is just to bitch about everything. <laughs> I'm not a bad slime. As you uh, as you approach down the corridor, you can hear uh, a voice in the distance. Uh, seems to be very <laughs> agitated, talking about the immigrants that have uh, <laughs> been invading its territory lately. Uh, okay. It's using all kinds of, of racial slurs. and, uh, and uh, Go ahead and give me a knowledge nature check. Oh, God. oh, that's a natural 20. Yeah, you can tell this is a ranting slime. <laughs> and then everyone across the table just groans, because obviously they know what that is. And they're like... Oh, no. My grandpa reincarnated as a slime again. (laughs) Uh. A local minister, James Travenstead, predicted that occult groups would flock to the Guidestones and warned that someday a sacrifice will take place here. Those inclined to agree were hardly discouraged by Charlie Clamp, the sandblaster charged with carving each of the 4,000 plus characters on the stones, because apparently during the hundreds of hours he spent etching the guides the guide stones he said that he had been constantly distracted by quote strange music and disjointed voices oh wow which he's using a sandblaster and like you know these people there there are other people there working i'm imagining all it really was was like they were playing music on the radio and people were talking off in the distance but he couldn't quite hear him over the sandblaster he's just like dude it was so weird there was music coming it sounded like uh Black Sabbath? 
Oh my gosh, Black Sabbath, you know that's the devil's music. And uh, they were talking about drinking beers and smoking joints when they got off work. And I was like, you devil spirits, you get out of here. What do you What do you guys do for a living? What, do you, what kind of weed are you going to smoke? And like, I heard them come back and they were like, Charlie, shut up and do your job. And I was like, oh man. And I, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. You were going somewhere with it. <laughs> I was, and then I I took the wrong fork in the road or something. I guess. <laughs> uh, you were you were like right there on the cusp of it too. Oh, but that's funny. But I, like that's just what I'm imagining is that like yeah. the other workers are playing music and talking, and he just is barely hearing them over the sound of the sandblaster, and he thinks that it was like something paranormal. <laughs> yeah, it's just I, I I would not be surprised. That would not shock me in the slightest. <laughs> that sounds like something that would happen. So the team that built the Guidestones never knew who was financing the project. Because again, it was all kept secret. Right. They just knew that it was the biggest monument in, the, in their county's history. So the unveiling took place on March 22nd, 1980. And it was a community celebration. Yeah. Woo! Devil worship! <laughs> Congress member Doug Barnard, whose district contained Elberton, addressed a crowd of 400 that flowed down the hillside, and there were television crews uh, there from as far as Atlanta, and soon Joe Findlay was the most famous Elbertonian since Daniel Tucker, the 18th century minister memorialized in the folk song Old Dan Tucker, which I... Do not know. Yeah, never heard it, but apparently he was really famous. He was as famous as Davy Crockett. <laughs> he was as famous as Joe Finley. <laughs> oh, gosh. And basically, this, this area is described as being as rural as rural can be. Yeah. Because it was bounded by the Savannah and the Broad Rivers, but it was miles from the nearest highway. So Yeah, so it was out there a ways. Yeah. But suddenly, it became a tourist destination. Uh-huh. Because some rich guy decided, eh, I want to build a monument. Not to myself, but for the apocalypse. Right. Uh, I mean, they were seeing visitors from all over the world. Um, they had people from Japan, China, and India, and basically all over the world that were wanting to go see the monument. And... Uh, I can imagine how well that went over. I feel like it was a bittersweet thing for them because their yeah. their small town is now seeing more revenue from the, the tourists. Mm-hmm. But it's for something that they consider to be devil worship or the devil's work. Yeah. So. And I can't imagine people with that sort of mindset are any too happy to be seeing foreigners. Especially in the South. Yeah, especially in Georgia. And Finley boasted that he had put Elberton on the map, and in 2005, that was um, affirmed literally when National <laughs> Geographic Traveler listed the Guidestones as a feature in its geotourism map guide to the Appalachia. I love that. He deserves that. Good job. Um, I mean, does he, though? I mean, like, yeah, he built it, but if it weren't for R.C. Christian... Who funded it and came yeah. up with the idea. Like, Christian was actually the one who put Elberton on the map. Technically, yes. But does he claim the rights to it? No. <laughs> no, because nobody knows who he is. Yeah. So, anybody who read what was written on the stones, they were uh, unsettled by what it said. Really? Yeah. The dictates that were carved on the monument. And, like, some people said it wasn't necessarily what was written there. They just got this weird feeling while they were reading it. Huh. But the dictates that were carved on the monument were as follows. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's, like, humanity, not just, like, any one country. Just, like, humanity in general. Just 500 million of us. No more, no less. Did you say billion? Million. Okay. I was going to say no. It says million. <laughs> yeah, 500 million. So... Let's just go murder everybody in Asia. Oh, no. That, I mean, that right there is, what, a couple billion people? <laughs> uh, number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Okay. <laughs> now, the second half of that, all right, that sounds pretty good, fitness and yeah. diversity. Yeah, yeah. But guide reproduction wisely sounds that? a lot like... Eugenics. Yeah. <laughs> That's Eugenics. <laughs> I was going to say euthanasia, and then I was like, wait, that's not the word I want. No, no, Although, that's death with dignity. Euthanasia sometimes, not always, but sometimes goes hand in hand, hand, in hand with euthanasia. Yeah, that's the truth right there. Because 
Those f young people in Asia, those youth in Asia. Mom. Get it? I was drinking. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I had to try so hard not to spit energy drink all over my mic. <laughs> oh, jeez. Definitely the first half of that sounds like eugenics. Yep. Uh, number three, unite humanity with a living new language. I can get behind that. Um, it's, it sounds a lot like globalism, which I know a lot yeah. of Americans are against. But Because, I mean, it's good to have a lingua franca so everyone can like talk to each other and understand each other. But I'm kind of skeptical at that because, I mean, the diversity of languages, you really want to kill that? Because, I mean, there's so much culture right. that's wrapped and into, like, the languages that have survived to this point. And people are already dying out and, like, losing and it's, all of that what, history. What gets me about that whole thing is that having a, a uniform language worldwide would be great. And, mm -hmm. you know, but no matter how hard you try to keep other languages alive, if you have a universal language, the others are probably going to die. Yeah. Eventually. Just for ease of communication. But I mean, counter that with things like dialect. Like Cockney rhyming slang, which is what I was trying to say earlier when I, I caught up. You were, I knew what <laughs> yeah. you were going for. And like uh, Louisiana Creole and uh, all of the different like dialects in like Japanese, the Mandarin and Cantonese versions of the Chinese language. Even if you've got a universal standard, there will be regional variations. So moving on, number four, okay. rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Okay. This one, I can absolutely get behind. Yeah. But, as we'll see later, this one specifically drew a lot of ire from the Christians because it was basically saying, don't be too into your religion. Because mm -hmm. if you're too into your religion, you can't rule things with like compassion and measured reason. That's like the opposite of like right. Protestant Christianity. <laughs> uh, number five, protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Number six, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court, which we kind of sort of have with the UN, but the UN is also pretty much a joke. Yeah, th like, we need to strengthen the UN just to maintain peace throughout the, like, the international body. But right now, like, if you don't have, like, the nations themselves holding up and respecting the UN, it, like, especially the big powers, it's not gonna hold up. Number seven, avoid petty laws and useless officials. Please. <laughs> oh my god, please. Number eight, balance personal rights with social duties. Okay, yeah. Like, the further you go, this almost just sounds like socialism or communism. Like, literally, it doesn't sound that bad once you get past the, you know, eugenics. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, number nine, prize truth, beauty, love, and seeking harmony with the infinite. That's so new age. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing beauty is an abstract term. Yeah. Beautiful people. Although, yeah. there is that thing about eugenics. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah! Oh, dear. And then number ten, be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. And yeah, it's, it, it's actually repeated twice. We had to say it twice so we could get it through your thick heads. <laughs> <laughs> right. Probably should have just, the whole thing should have just been leave room for nature. Over and over and over. <laughs> Yeah, just like do that like 57,000 times in different variations. Sometimes they're placing the letters for numbers and secretly it's a code for the genetic uh, uh, next evolution of humanity or something. Uh, so, I mean, you know, uh, aside from a couple of problematic things, these aren't bad tenants to live by. Yeah, I mean, once you get past the first, you had me in the first half, I'm not going to lie. But once you get past the first half. Yeah, the first two, especially. Yeah. So, as locals debated the relative merits of these commandments, the dire predictions of Travenstead, that minister, seemed to be coming true because within a few months, mm -hmm. there was a coven of witches from Atlanta that adopted the Guidestones as their home away from home, 
and they would. I make, am not surprised. <laughs> right, and they would make weekend pilgrimages. <laughs> they would make weekend pilgrimages. Pil- is that right? Pilgrim? Yes. Okay. Yeah, pilgrimages. They would make weekend pilgrimages. Weekend. Ob- weekend pilgrimages. Oh, weekend. Yes. Weekend weekends. Every weekend they would come to Elberton <laughs> to stage various pagan rites. <laughs> and as as Martin says, uh, they would dance and chant and all that kind of thing. And there was at least one warlock witch marriage ceremony there held there. I love that. That's adorable. There were no humans sacrificed on the altar of the stones, but there oh. were rumors that several chickens were beheaded. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, that could just be they brought their own chickens to slaughter for food to eat because they yeah. were like super organic or something. People do that all the time. You right. don't you don't get on people for beheading chickens. It's just meat. In a 1981 article in the monthly magazine UFO Report, they cited a Nauni Batchelder who was a, a noted Atlanta psychic, predicted <laughs> that the true purpose of the guides would be revealed. Quote, within the next 30 years. And when the stones are viewed from directly overhead, they form an X, which this report said would made a, make a perfect landing site. For the aliens. Yeah, for, obviously. Clearly. So visitors kept coming, but after several failed investigations into the identity of uh, R.C. Christian, the media completely lost interest. Uh, but it flared again briefly in 1993 when Yoko Ono, yes, Yoko Ono. That Yoko Ono. The Yoko Ono contributed a track called Georgia Stone to a tribute album for an avant-garde composer, John Cage, on which Ono was chanting the 10th and final guide nearly verbatim, be not a cancer huh. on earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. A decade later, when Roseanne Barr tried to work a bit on the Guidestones and tour, come back to her, nobody's gonna give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it was Roseanne Barr. Right. It's still a tourist attraction, but at this point, like, I mean, nobody really cares about it. Aw, that's a shame. It was really cool for a while there. <laughs> yeah. So Christian kept in touch with Martin, actually. Okay. And, like, they, they wrote back and forth so regularly that they just became pen pals. And um, occasionally Christian would call from a payphone at the Atlanta airport say he was in the area and they would rendezvous for dinner in Athens um, which is about 40 miles west of Elberton yeah and at, by this time Martin no longer questioned the secrecy of it Christian had basically just completely deflected Martin's curiosity when the two first met by quoting Henry James observations of Stonehenge quote you may put a hundred questions to these rough-hewn giants as they bend in grim contemplation of their fallen companions, but your curiosity falls dead in the vast sunny stillness that enshrouds them. And Christian never would tell him a thing about the group that he belonged to. And he received his last letter from Christian right around the time of 9-11 terrorist attacks. He assumes that the Christian, who would have been in his mid-80s by this time, has since passed away. Oh, so. that's fair, yeah. Three or now four decades later, there's still, like, the the general population doesn't seem to care about these anymore, but there are still people trying to fill, come up with all sorts of explanations for these stones. Yeah. Uh, Is what you're looking up relevant? Do we need to stop so you can say something? Oh, no. I'm just holding it for my theory. Okay. (laughs) One of these people... Uh, is an activist named Mark Dice and is the author of a book called The Resistance Manifesto. Mm -hmm. In 2005, he began to demand that the Guidestones be smashed into a million pieces. Asshole. Yep. This is our history now. He claims that the monument has a deep satanic origin. Well, then it has to be kept standing for freedom of religion. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that was a stance that earned him a lot of coverage, both in print and on the web. And according to him, Christian was a high-ranking member of a Luciferian so- secret society uh-huh. uh, at the forefront of the New World Order. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> like, where he got this information, no one knows. He, I'm guessing it was just wild speculation. Mm-hmm. But he said, quote, The elite are planning to develop successful life extension technology in the next few decades that will nearly stop the aging process. 
and they fear that with the current population of Earth so high, the masses will be using resources that the elite want for themselves. The Guidestones are the New World Order's Ten Commandments. They're also a way for the elite to get a laugh at the expense of the uniform, no, the uninformed masses, as their agenda stands as clear as day, and the zombies don't even notice it. Uh huh. So that's a pretty bold f- claim. Yeah, it's a pretty bold claim. Yeah. Well, the ironic part of that is that what he said has produced even more publicity for the Guidestones. Yeah. Ironically enough, it's like, what are the Christians trying to burn down today? Oh, a monument? Let's go see what this is all about. Right. Oh, they're trying to burn records of a new artist? <laughs> Let's go see what that artist is all about. It, it happens all the time. I think that was like... Yeah. 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 But that brought more visitors to the monument, and it actually made the Elbert County officials even less inclined to remove the only major tourist attraction in the area. <laughs> who would have guessed? Oh, I wonder about that. Phyllis Brooks, who runs the Elbert County Chamber of Commerce, pronounced herself aghast in mm-hmm. November of, uh, I'm guessing, 2008, when the Guidestones were attacked by vandals for the first time ever. Oh. Uh, Dice denied any involvement in the assault, and but he seems to have inspired it, because spray-painted on the stones were messages like, Jesus will beat you, Satanist, and no one world government and there were also things that asserted that the council on foreign relations is run by the devil that 9-11 t- attacks were an inside job that president obama is a muslim like uh, all that man. yeah i mean well this is would have been right around when obama took office so yeah they also splashed the guide stones with polyurethane which is way more difficult to remove than paint yep and despite the graffiti's alignment with his views, Dice says that he disapproved of the acts because a lot of people were glad such a thing happened and saw it as standing up against the New World Order, while others who are unhappy with the stones saw the actions as counterproductive and inappropriate. Yeah. So it, it's your, your typical conservative, I'm not going to condemn this, but... But this is not how we conduct ourselves. We yeah. conduct ourselves according to politeness politics. <laughs> And graffitiing is beneath us. Not like anything can be done with a little bit of property damage. Martin said that he he does not care for dice or his Luciferian secret society take. Yeah. Because he says he's not sure like what is going on here, but like he said that Mr. Christian always seemed like a decent and sincere person. So yeah. Dice is not the only person that, with a theory about the guidestones, obviously. One Jay Widener, a uh, former Seattle radio commentator, a turned erudite conspiracy hunter, <laughs> oh. has heavily invested time and energy into one of the, the most high, popular hypotheses about this. And his uh, argument is that Christian and his associates were Rosicrucians. Those are Rosicrucians? F- yes, followers of the Order of the Rosy Cross, which is a secret oh. society of mystics that originated in the late medieval Germany and claim understanding of esoteric truths about nature, the universe, and the spiritual realm that have been concealed from ordinary people. So kind of, you know, new agey stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember something about a bunch of those guys being involved with the Nazis. (laughs) That doesn't surprise me. Hence, Uh, eugenics. Right. Widener says that the the name R.C. Christian is an homage to the legendary 14th century founder of the Rosicrucians, a man who oh. identified as Freighter CRC and later as Christian Rosenkreuz. So the secrecy has been a was a hallmark of the Rosicrucians. Uh, they announced themselves to the world in the early 17th century with these anonymous manifestos that created this huge uproar across Europe, despite the fact that no one was ever able to identify a single member. And while the guides on the Georgia stones fly in the face of Orthodox Christian eschatology they conform quite well to the tenets of rosicrucianism which right stress reason and endorse like a harmonic relationship with nature which is why this guy thinks that maybe they this group were rosicrucians and i mean like rc christian kind of you know rc christian like i would have said that rc stood for like royal crown cola except royal crown was invented in no, wait. Yeah, it was it was in 1905. So 
Yeah, that could hit the timeline. Okay. Anyways, yeah. Continue. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> so this guy comes up with a like a really decent theory about why this guy's name is R.C. Christian. And, you know, with the Rosicrucians and everything. And your whole yeah. thing is, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's R.C. Cola. <laughs> I think well, he's just, who knows? Maybe RC He's tired Cola. of this two soda system. <laughs> well, maybe RC Cola is a front group for the Rosicrucian Christians. You know, they share all the same uh, uh, initials. Are you wearing your tinfoil hat right now? <laughs> no, but I've got a blanket on my head. Does that count? I don't know. I, if you're not wearing your tinfoil hat, I don't know if you can call yourself a conspiracy theorist, which it seems like where you're going. <laughs> I don't know. I just I'm I'm just thinking. I'm I'm coming up with possibilities as for why this guy could be so rich. <laughs> Widener also has another theory about the purpose of the guidestones. He was an authority on the hermetic and alchemical traditions that spawned the Rosicrucians. He believes that for generations the group had been passing knowledge down of the solar cycle that climaxes around every thirteen thousand years. Yeah. And during this culmination, coronal mass ejections are supposed to devastate the Earth. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the shadowy organization behind the Guidestones is now orchestrating a planetary chaos, as Widener Ooh. believes, that began with the recent collapse of the U.S. financial system, the Depression, back in around 2008, and uh -huh. will result eventually in the major disruptions of oil and food supplies, mass riots, and ethnic wars worldwide, all leading... To the big event on December 21st, 2012. Okay, never mind. I, like, the more I read this, I was just like, holy shit, this is all happening. Oh, shit, it's happening. <laughs> See, 2020 is the new 2012, okay? The Mayan calendar was just off by eight years. I, I think I think we can blame February. But, like, literally all of this shit has been happening recently. Like, Literally. Oil disruptions, food supplies are, are going shortening. There have been mass riots in multiple countries because of dictators and shit. Oh, yeah. There have been genocides worldwide lately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everything to do with China and the Uyghurs. Like, this is, uh. this is like, we're almost to the end, so this is one of those paragraphs I just kind of skimmed. And I yeah, didn't really fair. read it. Uh. And then as, like, I, I don't know if you could tell in my voice, but, like, <laughs> the more tell. I read, I was just like, what the f*** is going on? <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, conspiracies, ha ha lol, <laughs> holy shit, <laughs> what? Uh. After hearing these ideas, uh, Martin said that this is just the sort of thing that makes him want to tell people everything he knows. Um, and he's long since retired from banking and he no longer lives in Elberton, but he is still the Guidestone's official and only secret keeper because Finley is dead. Yeah. But he's like, I made a promise. I'm not going to tell anybody. And since he also made a promise to destroy all the records of his dealings with Christian, um, he hasn't kept a single one. Mm -hmm. Or no, he hasn't kept that one. Not yet. Yeah. So apparently he has not destroyed the records yet. Okay, that's good. In, in the back of his garage, there's a large plastic bin stuffed with every document connected to the Guidestones that ever came into his possession, including the letters from Christian, which just seems irresponsible because especially yeah. if he's telling people about this. Like, somebody's going to go steal that shit. Yeah, it's almost like begging someone. I can't say anything, but here right. are all the secret documents that I put in the same place. All my eggs are in one basket, if you know what I mean. Can right. you just come pick that up, please, and thank you? It's almost like a sitcom kind of thing where they're like, well, I promised I wouldn't say anything, but if you guess what they told me, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Okay, uh, but yeah, like, exactly. if they guess it, you have to tell them yes or no, and you're essentially telling them what, like, you're just trying to yeah. justify your own shitty behavior. <laughs> Basically. <sighs> so that's all we've got for the Guidestones. Yeah. Now, the two mysteries, I'm going to break this down into two mysteries. The first okay. one, who was R.C. Christian? And the second one, what's the actual purpose behind the Guidestones? Hmm. That is... I mean, aside from the obvious. Question. Apocalypse now! Woo! Nah. Um, well, do you want me to start or do you want yeah. to start? Since I presented okay. from the first. Okay, so... Royal Crown Cola was uh, established oh in <laughs> 1905, which means 
by the 1980s, it will have been well established and uh, it would have made plenty of money to finance whatever the mysterious uh, Coke magnate's desires were. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't put it past him to have been part of the Rosicrucian, whatever you call it, order. Rosicrucian, yeah. Right. And it's like he's practically screaming it by like having like Christian as the surname. He could have chosen something like John Smith, but no, he had to be all fancy and be like, I am R.C. Christian. Okay. So like clearly the pseudonym had a meaning. Had a meaning. But yeah, you know our our sequel has never been as successful, quote unquote, as like cola or Pepsi, never partook in that whole war. And part of that would probably be because they didn't put all of their money into in, into expanding their business. They invested their money in other more esoteric pursuits, like the monuments. And and you know their their owners have never really gotten into any like public situations they're not known to the public we don't do you know who owns rc cola i don't uh. <laughs> usually exo exo uh eccentric rich people are well known by the public like elon musk and him and his wife naming their daughter ex ash 12. i know it doesn't say who started it but it, right now it's owned by the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. Ah, see, yeah. Uh, it was started by Cole Hampton Hatcher. No, Claude A. Hatcher, who owned the Cole Hampton Hatcher grocery store. And it started because he gotten into a tiff with Coca-Cola for having bought a whole bunch of their syrup and decided, I'm never buying from you again. I'm going to make my own damn soda. So he was tired of the two soda system. Exactly. He was tired of the two soda system. He was going to make his own damn soda and he wasn't going to like take any of their shit. <laughs> so that's how it started. But uh, yeah, so clearly the, Ro the Rosicrucian Christian group is part of the Illuminati and the One World Order, but they're not like the the villains that everyone would assume them to be, clearly. Mm -hmm. They're just sort of, you know, looking at the end time signs and biding their time and trying to lay down guides, uh, guidelines for people to figure out their own way through life once uh, the world goes to shit. Okay. Yeah. So that's my theory. Now, is that your whole theory? Or is that just your theory on, like, who R.C. Christian was? That, that's my theory on who he was, more or less. And the reason why would be they pretty much knew the end times were coming and they had that prediction set out, you know, which is pretty accurate to today. And they're just like, you know, a, a sort of like a contingency plan. Just have that. Okay. Just in case. Okay. See, I think uh -huh. that... I, I don't want to go the alien route, but... <laughs> but aliens. Honestly, here's what I think. Okay. I think R.C. Christian was some kind of time traveler person. All right, all right. And he knew that the apocalypse was coming. Mm hmm And so, in order to try and save the planet from mm -hmm. destruction and rewrite history, he came back and... You know, like maybe he went back in the past and started a bank account. Over time, the interest grew to where he had all of this money that he could do, you know, do this with. Yeah. And I think that his secret, secret society group is a, a group of like, kind of like in uh, Terminator, how there's the, the group of humans who send the one Terminator back. It's kind of like that. Yeah. That's the secret society group. The group of people who are like, we got to change this. Who's going to do it? And he was like, I'll do it, motherfucker. And uh, <laughs> so he goes back in time and gets this built so that when the apocalypse happens, we have tenants to live by. Yeah. Some sort of order in the chaos. Namely eugenics. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, that's pretty much my theory right there. Yeah, can we just scratch out the eugenics on that thing? I don't know, man. It's part of it. Man. You, you never know. If Since he is a time traveler, or if he is a time traveler, maybe, like, that's just a sacrifice that we have to make so that the world will survive. Well, I mean, unless you've got anything else to add. Is that like your whole theory? Yeah, pretty much. I mean. Okay. Time traveler trying to stop the apocalypse. Pretty much. I would not stop it, but like make sure that there's a world after the apocalypse. Yeah. Dr. Stone it. But yeah, unless you've got something else to add, I think we're, we're done with this yeah. one. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, so a hell probably. Hell of a long episode for such a short explanation. We got off on several tangents, to be fair. Anyway, well, that's another mystery of the books, guys. As we usually say, if you have a mystery that you would like to hear us solve right here on the podcast, you can send that suggestion to mysteries solved podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. You can also contact us on Twitter at UMS underscore podcast, on Facebook at Unsolved Mysteries Solved. And then we've, we've got the Discord server and the Facebook group. And Patreon is up. Last Saturday, we put up our first $10 tier of, like, outtakes. Yeah. For, uh, which which case was that again that we were looking at? I, ed- I edited it and I don't remember. I believe it was Atlantis. Yeah, we put up Atlantis. So. By the time you're listening to this, the, the very first bonus episode for the $5 tier will be up on the patreon so if you guys want to go subscribe to our patreon help us out a little bit Uh huh. we would dearly appreciate it and dearly love you and you would get access to a whole new realm of content and a sh- personalized shout out on the show on a future episode Woo-hoo! the contest is still going uh, you have until next saturday at midnight or i guess sunday technically to get your entry in like i said at the top of the show and yep. we'll pick winners and I think that's all I've got, unless you've got something else. Hey guys, some of you might not know this, but I uh, have taken to narrating audiobooks on occasion, and one of my newest audiobooks just came out. So if you want to check out Boy of the Week by Emily Camp on Audible, that would be awesome. It's basically a teenage romance sort of thing. Like, this one girl drops into educational support because she is so boy crazy, she can't keep her grades straight. And it is sort of a slice of life, we're growing in ourselves and with each other sort of story. Well, that sounds like something that I want to listen to. (laughs) Does it really? I don't know, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely, guys, go go check that out if you want to hear more of Cassandra. I think that does it for this week. We'll be back next week with a brand new Unsolved Mystery to solve for you guys. And as we always say, don't question us or what? You will be put down. Goddamn right they will. Woo! I got the catchphrase. Oh, and go rate and review us on iTunes. Yeah. And then send in a screenshot to enter yourself in the contest. Anyway. Yeah, you got, you want that bumper sticker, right? Because I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> you can find a picture of what they look like on uh, our Twitter, actually. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see you next week, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye Bye-bye. Now. Shut up, man. This is why I don't do these things in person. <laughs> Have a seat, class, and let Fernand educate you. From executive producer Persephone Rose. We've all got something we're dealing with here, and sometimes things get rough. In a city populated by monsters and demons. I want six pizzas topped with your freshest sacrificed goat. Comes the story of a pizzeria that also sells weed. Hey, G-Man, you got any new bud flavors? One crew must face unprecedented challenges. Let me talk to your manager. Anything with meat on it. You are definitely overcharging me. Of all the terrible customer service atrocities. We just have to push through and try our best. Let the transference of spirits begin. As the dough rises. Just what kind of business are you running around here, huh? And an empire falls. We didn't order any stinking pizza. Hey, wait. What shop did you say you were from again? You weren't really going to kill him, are you? I told him you'd be nothing but trouble. Imagine my surprise when it turned out I was right. Hey, boss. Fernie's gone and lost as another driver. Get me my silver bullet gun! No! My offspring have a basic right to eat. You are under arrest on cross-dimensional terrorism charges. We have extensive evidence linking you to massacres in at least six distinct universes. <laughs> Postal Roach Audio proudly presents Emperor Pigs, <laughs> Pizza, and Sigs. <laughs> Believe it or not, we've dealt with worse situations around here. EmperorPigs.com. <laughs> <laughs>